because usually it's like that, right? A, a creative genius, they, they focus on creative. Like, I don't need to worry about this managing money stuff, right? I was actually putting to get, putting this together for something and I was like, you know what? Nobody's ever written a book on editing sales copy before. So I rushed up to finish it. <laughs> I need a meeting with you. I'm gonna hop on a plane and we're gonna have a discussion, right? Yeah, we, need a, we need a talk. <laughs> and, Hey, welcome to another episode of the Dan Lok Show. I have had so many guests coming to my show, but today's guest is very, very, very special. Now, for those who know me, knows that when I was struggling as a young man, that I found my first mentor. His name is Alan, right? And Alan gave me the skill of copywriting. And that's in my early 20s, that's how I turned my life around, right? That's literally like copywriting saved me and turned my life around. And what you don't know is, Alan, my first mentor, actually had a mentor as well. His name is Gary Halbert. Now, for those who are in marketing and copywriting, you know, Gary, no doubt in my mind, is one of the true legend in marketing and advertising. Someone, anyone who's in the know, anyone who's in marketing and advertising, any serious marketer, chances are they've studied and under like, some way, shape, or form, Gary Halbert letter. So today I have Bon Halbert, the son of Gary Halbert. Gary Halbert's first apprentice, first mentee, right? Uh, so, yes. Bon, welcome to the Dan Lok Show. I'm honored, I'm so excited um, to have you here. I have so many questions, so many, many, many questions for you. I'm uh, glad to be here and I'm glad to answer all your questions. <laughs> uh, but what's it like to grow up with a dad like that? It was very unique, I'll tell you that. There's no doubt about it. Um, if you want to become the best in the world at something, and my dad, I truly believe, was not only, I mean, I think he was the greatest of all time, but all time, if, 100%. He, if he was, um, at, you know, while he was working, he was the best copywriter on earth. And what was something that he had that, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, what does it take to become the greatest or something like that? What it was, was he lived and breathed it. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of you will have a father or a mother who's got a hobby and they really, they're into it and stuff like that, mm. uh, but it's a hobby. Or they have a work thing that they do and you kind of don't see them outside of, you know, you only see them outside of work. So, you oh, know, yes. if your dad's a yes. surgeon, you can't go into surgery with them. Yes. My father was into copy and marketing and in a way that it was all that we did. So, and I say we, because when I was a little kid, I was stuffing and stamping and sealing envelopes for testimony. Um, yeah, I mean, is, that, is it child labor, like free child labor? <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, 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 absolutely. In fact, he, he called it that. He, he called it child slave labor. Oh my goodness. And he would, he would bounce, if it, you know, like, um, I remember the first time I met Joe Sugarman, Yes. Um, he was, he had Batman credit cards, the original, when the, the original ones, um, he still has them, but it was like 1970 something, like, you know, right. 1976 around that time. And my dad, if, if one of the, if one of his clients or somebody was trying to have, uh, talk about some, possibly selling something to kids, he would go and test it with us, mm. you know, um, so he was con it was um you know we were part of the guinea pig experiment from the get-go um so what what was going on though is at dinner table we talked about marketing we learned about business and numbers and you know list brokerage companies and hot lists and you know what was um cost per thousand and all of these things and you know i'm learning it so early in fact there was a um uh, an email I sent out and what happened was, and here's a good lesson on copywriting. Mm. I have a lot of great copy comes from great conversations. Mm, and yes. my dad would take anything you said that really got his attention and he could use it in copy. He would use anything that he said that somebody else reacted to and use it in copy. And I do a similar thing. And one time I was talking with a friend of mine and I said, you know, if it wasn't for the boron letters, the series of letters my dad wrote, where he talked about how I was walking down the street with him one day, and I said, you know, I'm lucky that, you know, I, you know, my dad had 
was a terrible financial manager. So he was down on his luck at one point. And I said, you know, I'm really fortunate. And he says, why? And I said, because I get to see how you make it. I said, my older brother got to play with all the toys and everything, but I get to see how you do it. And he thought that was the smartest thing any little kid had said. So he immediately started pulling me out of school to go to meetings with people like Jay Abraham. I was flying back East with him to um, hang out and be part of brainstorming sessions with list brokers and uh, Ben Suarez and all kinds of, you know, people. I was actually the only, you know, not, not just a kid. I was one of the few young people in any of these meetings as it was going. And so my dad was training me anyway. So, I said, if it wasn't for those boron letters, nobody would know, nobody would believe that I had an education that thorough so young. Mm. And so I said, thank God my dad went to prison. <laughs> and, uh, my friend really laughed a lot. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to use that. And it became my subject line. And I remember somebody writing and going, man, he can write a subject line. <laughs> um, and the, but the point was anything that you used or did in life to translate to copy. And the difference between really, really big marketers is they're absorbing it. They don't turn it off. If you're going to sit down and look at a blank screen and say, I got to get this email out by Monday at one o'clock and you sit down at Monday at nine o'clock and you're looking at a blank screen, mm. you're going to lose to somebody who's been walking around at the beach and thinking about that email, who hears a great line in a movie. They're like, ah, I can use that. Um, reads a great line in a book, hears something in a song, you know, has a conversation with somebody, mm. you know, they, these, um, that kind of in tune and that kind of just all in attitude is what made my dad really, it was one of many things that made him really, really special. Mm. But as his kid, you were stuck with it. And uh, one of the things my dad was, is, um, Sam put it best. He said, you know, my, Gary was a social scientist. Mm. And he would try and get reactions out of people in real life. He'd try and make them nervous. He would try and get them uh, pissed off. He would try and get them excited. He would try and get them to ask more questions. So imagine that you grow up and your dad, almost everything he was saying was clickbait, right? Or a closing argument. Mm. And it was that kind of a thing. Mm. And sometimes, it, you know, it, I didn't appreciate it until I was older because my dad used to do this and I do it now every once in a while myself is he'd get into an elevator and if it was really crowded he would wait till the doors closed and then he would turn around and say i just want to ask if everybody here has accepted jesus christ as their lord and savior and it was just making everybody super nervous right yeah. because somebody's like you know oh my god is you know is that person serious and somebody else is like i'm going to be stuck listening to somebody preach to me even if they were you know yeah. and it's messing, messing and with I people. started doing it too. Yeah. And, and the amazing thing about it, absolutely, it was just messing with people to get a reaction. Yeah. And seeing that some people would have a major reaction. I did this once at an event in um, uh, Brooklyn. Yes. And I did it. And it was uh, the first person I'm looking to was uh, this guy who was an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> and, <I> said, <laughs> and I'm like, I know you haven't. <laughs> And I'm in there with David Deutsch and Sam Markowitz, who are good friends of mine. Oh, and, I'm like, and I know you two haven't either, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it was funny because the, all three of those people, the stranger and the two I know, you know, they're all laughing and having a good time, but you could see the nervousness on the people who were behind him and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But that's the way that my dad was. He didn't want a neutral reaction. He preferred even a negative reaction to a no reaction. Mm. And so when we did anything, it was, um, it was, he was experimenting with people. I mean, it would be, it could be the waitress. It could be, and it was anybody from all walks of life. And that's another thing that made my dad really yeah. special yeah. is a lot of people are great at selling to one type of prospect. My dad had winners selling to a different cross section of humanity. And, and I think what makes uh, Gary so special studying his work that he is, he's a student of life, right? He's a student of just people. Uh, he, he observes. It's not just, okay, I'm only reading marketing books and things like that, and that's all great. But I think what makes Gary like one of a kind, truly, the, like the Michael Jordan for copywriting of all time, it's those little conversations that, oh, he will observe. That's interesting. And, and that's when he always, you just study his letter. When I study his letters, it's always some interesting angle that no one has ever seen. Like, wow, yeah. where's that, where does that come from? That, it's like so out of the box, right? But it makes so much sense at the same time that it's, 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 it's so compelling, right? 
Uh, and like one thing, I'll share something very special. When my mentor, Alan, uh, he was writing copies, doing, running a, one of the largest financial education company, financial seminar company in, in Canada. Um, and then later on, he was um, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, right? And so then he retired. Now in his house, he actually has a huge library. I'm talking like one of the biggest personal library I've ever seen. And he has a, a section where it has a lot of Gary's material, the Gary Harbor letter. Um, I don't know if you remember the triple X uh, tape set, right? Like, uh, like um, the... Uh, I, know, like, I know all of it. In fact, we, we, we yeah, no. I, I know. You know, like all the... I was around Gary, for all of it. You got to remember, I wasn't just... I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so, so, so you know all of that. And, and really, um, then Alan, when he said, okay, I'm going to now move to a smaller house because of health, right? He actually gave me that. He kind oh. of passed on that to me, right? So, so now I have that in my library that I cherish a lot. And he said to me, he said this, because to him it's very personal because he learned from Gary, right? He said this section, this is all the Gary Hubbard materials, right? Now, then and I'm, I'm giving it to you. Like this is me, I've taught my skill to you. Now you go and impact the world, right? It's, it's a very special thing. Uh, I'm sure, Bon, you, you must have a, a treasure like box at home with, with yeah, all my favorite things that I have are like, you know, actual, you know, handwritten notes and, you know, ads and stuff oh, like that. Wow. Wow. Um, but, you know, growing up with him and being there when he'd have, I was there when he'd have that idea and he'd snap his fingers and he literally snapped his fingers. He got it. Then he'd okay. make it stop whatever he was doing. And then we'd pull over and he'd start writing and, and taking notes and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, I actually, I, I have his whole filing cabinet and stuff like that. And wow. I just, you know, um, for me, there's a sense of history in a lot of it. So um, legacy as well. It's legacy. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. But I have his actual copy of the um, coat of arms plaque. It is oh, of our coat yes, of arms. Yes. That. Yeah. Yes. Um, I have, you know, and the, and the thing for me was like when he did a lesson, by the time that he was writing about it in a newsletter, mm. okay, because, okay, let me take you back. So he first writes the, he starts getting into copywriting the day before I was born. Mm. Um, that was his first journey into it. He got fired from the last job he ever had mm. on that day. Mm. He got into his argument with his boss about having, wearing orange socks. And then what happened was, he started, you know, becoming really big and writing uh, copy and stuff like that. And then he, uh, in the middle of, of it, he was doing up and down cycles with his money because he would blow his money. He made quite a bit and then he would blow it and then he'd make quite a bit. Because I think, what would, would you say, because Gary knows he's so good at making it. So it's like not worried. Because usually it's like that, right? A, a creative genius. They, they focus on creative. Like, I don't need to worry about this managing money stuff, right? He had no respect for it. In fact, they, they, some psychologists that he had, he had talked to, you know, did some sort of, I don't know how the test worked, but said that he had very little respect for money yeah. itself. What my dad had was he wanted to solve the problem. And, you know, I, I, you know, that's one of the things that personality wise, you know, you pick up things from your parents. I like to solve problems, you know, and so I'm more motivated by that than I am something else. So I want to be, you know, if somebody says this is our highest open rate, I want to break that record. And I do. And I wanted to, you know, I became one of the first people to get Amazon to sell things for me. They do, they advertise for me. Mm. And these are things that I do based on, um, because, because somebody said you can't do it. And so that was the thing that motivated my dad. It was like, if somebody said you can't do it or That's this challenge. couldn't be done, Try to break it. So the the Gary the Halbertizing or not the Halbertizing the um the Halberts Incorporated promotion the 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 coat of arms mailing. Mm. He was trying to actually um, do what everybody said you couldn't do, which was to mail to the R R Donnelly list. Mm. The R R Donnelly list was a, was compiled of the names and addresses from the phone book all across the United States. Cold, very and, cold, basically. It's just the mass and, audience, right? Yeah. Not only is it cold, but it, you got to remember back then, you know, if you sold in the newspaper, you needed to have wide appeal. So you needed to sell weight loss, how to make more money, better sex, better fortune, things like that. So something that applied to a good, huge chunk of the, art, uh, of the audience, because every time you're, you're paying per thousand in circulation to yeah. put that ad in. Yeah. 
Yeah. And anybody who's not a potential prospect is what they call waste circulation. Yeah. And so, you know, and nowadays you can highly, you can, you can laser target people with, you know, online and, you know, the, the tools that you have today, it's much yeah. different. Yeah. But the broadest appeal was just people with an address and a name. And so my dad figured out when he did the, when he did his fake personal letter, he figured out how to sell stuff based on people's names. Now it only worked if you had an English, Scottish, or, you know, Western European name. So it's still, you know, there was still some waste circulation, but it was a gigantic piece of the Donnelly list. And so he was breaking that, you know, he was breaking that record. And so he liked to be the first to do things. And it, it was, it, like I said, he was, he was truly, not motivated by money. He was motivated by, um, by, you know, coming back from when he really needed it. He was motivated by uh, beating other people's, you know, making, setting the control and beating everybody else, mm. you know, and he did it and he did it in multiple. And he, he was, it was, it was I'm, incredible. I'm curious because I, if I remember correctly that I think Halbert was the first one, I think we remember to, like to me, he's the original thinker in terms of selling high ticket, right? Like he, I think he did an event in, in Key West, if I remember correctly. But back then, it was at an outrageous price for a seminar. Like no one's ever done a price like that, right? And then if I remember correctly, so then later on turned that into a tape set that also sold for a lot of money. Like tell me a little bit of that story. Because like how okay, did he do you're that? The seminar of the century in Century City, it was $5,000 a head yes. when nobody was charging that. Nearly yeah, like that crazy. So that's like back then. And, it's um, it's I think, crazy. I think my bro. This was in the 80s, early yeah. 80s. So, I mean, yeah. you're talking about, yeah, I mean, what was, and he was also, but, but, you know, going on top of that, I'll tell you the other thing is he was the first one to charge a percentage. There's a guy who charged per mailing before he did where they got, he said, I got, I get a nickel a letter that you send out, mm. but he was the first one to say, I want 5% of the gross. Mm. Okay. Mm. Um, I don't know of anybody who did it before him and he, and I asked him and he was also at that time, his rate was $15,000 an ad. Mm. And he said, do you know why I'm the first one to get $15,000 an ad? And I said, why? And he said, because I'm the first one to ask for it. That's cool. And he was, um, and, and, but the truth is the re the reason you get $15,000 an ad is because everybody else is trying to hire you for 10 and you don't have enough time. And so you say no. And then they say, well, what would make you do it? And that's usually a lot of people in their entrepreneurial and copywriting careers get to a point where they have to raise their price. Yes. And then they're shocked that everybody's still willing to pay the higher price. Yes. Um, and that's usually the, the pathway that happens is you're actually so busy. So t um, supply and demand, right? It's supply and demand and you actually don't want to do it. You know, <laughs> you're yeah. like, well, you know, but okay, that's the amount of money I can't turn down. So now this is your new price. <laughs> yes. So Gary yeah. was very, very good at not just, not just copywriting, but he, I think he's a master at, at, I guess now that nowadays would be personal branding or, or personal promotion, right? He's yes. Like, he, he, like think about back then the Gary Haber letter. Well, that's that's a personal brand. It's not you know direct mail marketing letter. No, it's the Gary Haber letter, right? So mm -hmm. what was what was his some of the lessons that you could share with us? Maybe you learned from him about like personal brand or well, what's his take on it? Well, okay. First of all, he he had to learn it by um, he had to learn it by testing as well. So one time he in the um, late seventies, he put out an ad where he had mentioned himself as the greatest copywriter who ever lived. Yes. And yes. Um, that ad bombed. <laughs> Nobody wanted to do that. And by the way, here's, this is a tip. This is a copywriting tip for yes. the audience. Yes. Um, when you're going about to, and you'll notice, and you'll notice this from the letters. Yes. When you're about to say something that makes yourself sound like you're very confident or good at something, what you want to do is dehumanize yourself before you say it. Okay. okay. Notice that in his pattern. So what you do is you say, you know, look, I'm not good at a lot of things. I don't know how to, you know, set my VCR. I just ruined a car because I didn't put oil in it. 
<laughs> you know, I didn't check the oil for the last two years and all this other stuff. But there's one thing that I am good at. I do know how to write copy. I ran controls. I've beaten, you know, I've beaten, I've, I've, I've created several controls. I've beaten several records and so forth and so on. Mm. Because in the prospect's mind, what happens is the, um, the prospect turns around and says, well, if I can learn from you what you're doing, I'll be better than you because I also can put oil in my car and I know how to set my, you know, set the timing. And I don't even use a VCR, I use a DVD, you know, player. Mm -hmm. And I can set the time on it. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, if you notice, everybody talks about, you know, look, your dad was very human in these, in these, um, in the letters where he was yeah. showing, expressing his humanity and everything. Yes. Well, yeah. that was part of the part that bonded you to him. Mm -hmm. So he had learned that, he had learned to stop hiding flaws early on in that. Mm -hmm. And the way that the Gary Halbert letter itself came out was he, when he, he actually went to Boron for something he did not do. And he turned around and he was very, this is one of the great lessons he had taught me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in here for something that I did not do, which was, and I know he didn't because I was there throughout the whole thing. He did not intend to rip people off. It was, if you read about it, what happened was a, a list broker who was shady mm -hmm. sold him a list, a giant list. And he, and my dad sunk all of his money into it because the test mailing was really great. What he did not know was that the list broker had taken that list done what is called a merge purge. He merged a whole bunch of other, uh, other people's lists mm. and purged out the people who were on every list. In other words, you couldn't mail this list and not make a sale because you just found the people who will buy any commemorative plate. Okay. Got it. Got it. So my dad says, let's mail the whole list. And he sinks all of his money into it and then it doesn't do well. So he doesn't have enough money to fulfill the orders. Okay. Mm. So anyway, they come drive by and they see that, you know, at the time we're living in this really nice house out on the beach. And they said, aha, you must be shady and you must be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Any case. So he says, I'm in here and I've done so I haven't done anything wrong. I didn't do this, but I've done other things that were wrong in my past. And I'm going to look at it as I'm clearing the slate. Mm went in he you know um he, they, they say he said they fed him really well because <laughs> they they did um a lot of people talk about country club you know prisons what actually what it was is they just converted an ex arm uh, ex air force officers quarters into mm -hmm. it that's what they did well while he was in there he started writing the series of letters to me that you know is the born letters in fact in your collection you might have something very rare which is the handwritten version of the of the boron letters mm. it's a large black book that actually shows copies of the actual letters mm. um and those are extremely rare they're not you know i've got like one case of them myself and <laughs> well anyway at least the, his of his stash of them but anyway so from that that became the basis for the gary halbert letter that he started putting out and then he put, he took uh, several of those letters, he put them together in a book called How to Make Maximum Money in Minimum Time. Yes. And then he sold I, that. I, I, I have the at, I have the at. Good. Yeah. Well, and so he put, and you'll notice in each one, it says, you know, this is from the so-and-so issue of the Gary Halbert letter, mm. right? So now when you see people doing like, you know, the free book plus shipping and stuff. Yeah, like the that, trip, trip wire, yep, all of that, yep, that's. It all goes back the to that. Day, even the lead <laughs> magnet, which is really Gary's a free report model. Exactly. It's nothing new, really. And so he so what he did was he started, you know, building it up from there. Mm. And then the other lesson I would say that I learned from that, which was true, was he took out he gave away great stuff. So a lot of people who are in the beginning make these mistakes of, you know, if I tell them this, I felt if I tell them this key, they'll feel like they won't need me or they won't want me. Mm. And so they don't, they're afraid to, they, you know, that's why so many people are telling people what to do, but not how to do it. Mm. I'll just give them like yeah. bits and pieces and, and not like, it's, it's just like, teasing. exactly. Yeah. But when you come across somebody who's willing to say, this is how you do it. This is everything. Mm. Then you're like, okay, give me more. And that's the person, no matter what they sell, you know, you trust them more to come back and get that good stuff. Yeah. And I remember this is also something he did in his personal life. As his kid, he didn't, he wouldn't tell me about like Santa Claus or the Easter bunny or anything like that. You know, I mean, you know, my mom and other people, you know, they did that kind of stuff. But I remember thinking that when me and my friends wanted to know something, if I asked my dad, I was getting the truth or at least his version of the truth for sure. Mm. 
because I could trust him. And so I took on that same type of thing, which is because if you give people the, the raw, the absolute honest, you know, truth about stuff, they trust you in a way that, that, you know, they don't think about it. So when my daughter asks me a question or I tell my daughter something, she knows I'm not just being nice because I'm her father. She knows it because I'm not nice when it's, when I, what I have to say is not nice. <laughs> I'm just brutally honest. And my dad was the same way. And he's the same way with his subscribers. He was very real. He was very open. He was very, um, you know, he gave, he gave you what you needed to know. And he gave, and he told you, but the one thing I think is the biggest thing that a lot of people get, don't get properly from the Gary Halbert letter, or at least sometimes I don't think they get it is people will come to me and they'll say, you know, your dad could have sold ice to Eskimos. And I'm like, then you're not getting his message. It's hard enough to sell people what they actually need. What they want and need. Yeah. I said, you know, uh, you got to go back to step one and, a, and of a starving crowd. <laughs> Actually, share, share that story quickly, because I, I know the story where Gary is asking, right? Like, if you, have, if you could have one advantage, what would it be? Share a little bit of that story. I think that's okay. Um, what he did was, and he had this, and this is the great thing about growing up with him. I learned all the lessons because I heard them over and over and over again. And one of the most common ones that I remember hearing from the very get-go was this lesson called the starving crowd. Yeah. And he basically would turn to somebody and say, okay, let's suppose God came down and we all have hamburger stands and we're all going to open up a hamburger stand, but we all get one advantage, yes. only one advantage from God. And he'd give you, you know, the location or whatever you want. And some people would say, I want fresh organic ingredients and I want the tastiest recipe mm -hmm. or I want, you know, this, you know, the, the, an advantage of having a great reputation or whatever. And my dad say, well, all I want is a starving crowd. Yes. It doesn't make a difference if I'm meeting, if I'm going to be feeding them, you know, stuff that's not the tastiest. If they're hungry, they're going to buy it. I don't have to do as much work. Yes. And that's what a lot of people don't understand is it's, you know, it's about doing, uh, it's about making the sales job easier. So one of the points that I want to make is, the copy itself, wording does matter. I'm not going to pretend it doesn't matter, but it's not nearly as important as the message and the ideas. So fresh ideas can sell themselves. So mm. the example I like to use is the, the Domino's pizza campaign. Everybody at that time was, there was lots of, lots of, lots of pizza joints all over the country. Yeah. And everybody was selling. I got an original Italian recipe. I've got the freshest agreement, ingredients. I got my old world grandmother's a, a recipe and it's won these awards. And everybody's, you know, competing on this. And Domino's was, the marketing team was smart enough to interview and do a little research and heard some people go, you know what? I just wish that pizza would come on time. You know, I order it and it doesn't show up for two hours. And so I don't get to eat it on my lunch break and I'm still starving. Or, and then when I order it two hours early, it shows up early. And it's cold. Yeah. All I wanted to be is delivered on time. And somebody else in the room goes, yeah, I wish that was true too. And they could, yeah, yeah. And this is where marketing takes hold. Yeah. That problem becomes an opportunity, yeah. right? Yeah. That problem becomes an opportunity. So they could have said 30 minutes or it's on us, half an hour or it's free. The wording wasn't really as important as the message. Now it is important because you want to make it short, concise, to the point. And believe, memorable, yes. Memorable, all these other things. But it was the message and the idea that was more important that allowed them. They could have written that in you know, several different ways and they're still going to dominate the pizza delivery service. Yes. Yeah. You know, so again, that's one of the things that I learned from my father is because a lot of people think of Gary Halbert and they think, you know, copywriting, 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 and they should because that's but what made him a great copywriter was he was first, and this is what he taught me, is to be a student of big ideas. Mm, yes, and that's what his best proteges do is they develop really good, unique, big ideas mm. that allow themselves to separate from the rest of the competition. Very, very true. Would you say, like, I'm curious with the Gary Harbor letter? Uh, I remember back then when I was looking at the site that like, this is before the actual newsletter um, mm -hmm. that. Um, I think it was, was it Gary? Like someone I think put a lot of that, maybe it's you, uh, put it on the website, the GaryHarbaletta.com. At the time it gets, it's, it gets, I remember, I think Gary was talking about on Alexia, it's, it's one of the top, top sites in the world. A lot of traffic going to the website. 
a lot has worked. It's 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 free. Like this, yes. just there, right? Um, still well, there. It, it, well, it's still there. In fact, what happened was my um, uh, my dad was doing the newsletter. It was one hundred ninety seven dollars a month. Yes. And then he decided to go ahead and go online. And he, uh, my brother, was the one who he had actually hired to put it up online. Got it. And um, I remember there were some funny stories about that because, you know, he'd be arguing with my brother because my, my dad wanted it in a very specific way. And to this yeah. day, people come to us and they're like, how come it's not formatted this way or how come it's set this way? It's like because we're doing it the way he wanted it done. And he yeah. fought with us to have it done in a certain way. So there's no way we're going to change it. And then when the day he passed away, everybody bombarded that site thinking we would take it down, yes. you know. And started downloading and, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many printers were drained of ink that day. Yeah. And so everybody's printing it out and everything. They didn't realize that, you know, that Kevin and I um, were such a part of all of this growing up. There was no way we were going to dishonor him by taking it down. Yes. And then um, what was funny is I started doing a bunch of uh, people would come along and ask me to do interviews about my father. And yes. I was like, they're like, do you mind us asking about your dad? And I'm like, of course not. I love my dad. I'll talk about him all day long. Mm. And then in a little while, they'd realize how much I knew about copywriting. And then they would start asking me questions about it. But the truth was, it all came back to him. Mm. So, for example, you know, I start and, and this has nothing to do. I, I don't sell a product here, so I'm not pitching anything. Mm. Um, people were coming to me and going, how do you get these really amazing open rates? Mm. Okay. And what I was doing that they didn't understand was this. I was breaking down my dad's A pile, B pile speech and applying it online. Mm. Now, do you know the A pile, B pile speech? Yep. Okay. A pile. Yeah, you, you go ahead. A pile, uh, family letter, personal. Oh, you've got the time or want to do it. Okay. So people come home and my, my dad was the inventor of what I call gun to the head marketing. That's because right. he literally said he was having lackluster um, results. And he met, he sat down, it was with my mom and he said, you know, I imagine somebody put a gun to my head and said, if you had to make a sale, what would you do differently? And if you don't, I'm going to pull the trigger. Mm. So at the time, all the conventional wisdom said, put your, um, you'll save money by putting your envelope or your mail in a window envelope. So you don't have to readdress the envelope and the letter. Mm. It'll save money. And if you save money, you need one less sale to make it profitable. Mm. Um, use bulk rate because without paying somebody to put on a stamp and for the lo lower cost of bulk rate, what's going to happen is you are going to save money. Mm. Okay. And put on all this teaser copy and stuff like that, because if you get somebody else to open it and it makes a sale, it's worth the extra cost. Mm. So my dad said, you know what? That's not the way I would do it. If my life was on the line, he said, people come home from a hard day's work and they sort their mail over a wastebasket and they yes. sort it into three piles. That's There's right. the A pile. The A pile is, you know, yeah. this is something that I've been wanting and waiting for. This is a letter, letter, letter from grandma. <laughs> that, he, yes. used, he used that, a letter from grandmother. It was an important bill, stuff I have to open. B pile was stuff I might open. You know, like I see an offer for an oil change. My car might need an oil change. I'll put that down. But, and if I didn't like it, it was going into the trash. Yeah. Well, B pile just piles up, right? And then one day somebody's coming over and they're like, you know, hey, uh, we're going to go to a movie. And people are coming to your house. You're cleaning up. You see all this B pile mail. You throw it right into the garbage. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, the B pile mail is the reason that somebody would pick up your mail and might order two months after you mailed it, right? <laughs> That's why you might get a couple orders. Yeah. Well, my dad said, instead, I want to be into the A pile. And what people were doing at this time is they were looking through their offline, their snail mail spam filter, which was their brain. Yes. And what was triggering it and told you it was junk mail was the window, the bulk rate. So my dad said, I'm going to send a number nine envelope. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hand addressed or type, not, you know, no label. It's yeah. going to corner card, which is the return address is going to have no name, just an address, yeah. an actual honest to God, first class stamp. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I'm going to send it. And when you open it, I'm not going to put in coupons. If there's a coupon, it's in a separate envelope. And he just he called it avoiding the oh yuck factor. So you didn't yeah. open the oh yuck. Yeah. Well, I was sitting there writing, I was putting together my first website. And I said, you know what? 
I'm going to put in a, up in the corner, in the right hand corner, this is where you're going to sign up and everything. I was like, what would, you know, what would I do if I was signing up? I put myself in the shoes of the prospect and I realized it just clicked on me. I'm like, the way people are sorting their mail right now is with spam email addresses. That's right. And here's the average thing. What somebody turns around and says, hey, by the way, I have a problem. I have, the example I like to use is I have stage fright. Mm. So I go looking on uh, Google and I say, you know, how to cure stage fright. Somebody says, oh, I've got the cure for stage fright. You know, mm. oh, just send me your, your email address, sign up and I'll send you a PDF. Mm. Well, I don't know this person from Adam. Yeah. So I give them a spam, my spam email address. And then I go into my spam email address. Okay. And 500 to a thousand emails have piled up there since the last time I was there. Yeah. Okay? And so I go right to the top and I, this person has done one of two things. They've either delivered and I'm practicing how to cure yeah. state, right? Yeah. Or they haven't delivered and I'm off back to the internet looking for my solution. Either way, I ignore or delete all those 500,000 emails in that spam email address. Yes. Okay. But later I go and check my regular email address and I see there's some stuff in the spam folder and I don't be just delete it. And the reason I don't is that grandma may have slipped through the mix, you know, slipped in there. Somebody, something important I wanted or signed up for might be there. So the moral of the story is it would be better for you to be in the spam box of a primary email address than in the primary box of a spam email address. Worry about getting a primary email address first. Mm. And then I said to myself, what would make me do that? And I said, and so what we did was um, I said, first, if somebody was delivering something that I had to react to quickly, yeah. because then I'm going to be checking that more often. And so if you're doing, if you say, Hey, I'm, we throw a lot of flash sales and last minute things and people get mad at me for not get, you know, because they come they get the message too late. So be sure to enter a primary email address you check often mm. to make sure you don't miss it. Mm. And then the other thing that came, it came to my realization was people don't operate two email addresses. They will, but they don't usually operate two email addresses on their phone. Yeah. So I would design content to be consumed on the phone. So we created the Gary on the go program and said, if you sign up, we'll send you newsletters that are formatted so you can read and make use of your time while you're in line at the bank or you're, in, you're going to the airport. Mm. Okay. And because of that, you know, and so you, you know, if somebody was designed to wanted something delivered to them on their phone, they use their primary email address. Yes. So my email addresses um, for that website, you know, my opening rates were sky high compared mm. to, you know, I mean, even AWeber and GetResponse were like, you know, man, your opening rates are astronomically high. Yes. So learning from my dad, the APAL, BPAL, again, this is something that, yes, I developed that. I did that and I, and I broke, you know, that was my challenge and I did it, but it all goes back to Gary Halbert thinking. It all went back to how do people sort their emails? Mm. What is it like when they go through their day and being hypersensitive to that and then saying, okay, this is how to solve that. This is what would make me do that. Mm. And, you know, that's the kind of Gary Halbert thinking that you want to employ um, to make advantages even in today's, you know, um, it, I don't care if, you know, the new, the new hot, you know, Vine came and went, right? MySpace came and went. <laughs> I don't care if it's Facebook. I don't, you know, the Gary Halbert proteges are not afraid of the technolo technological changes that happen in the world because we're going to walk through it with a certain mindset mm -hmm. and a certain way of thinking that's going to allow us to get right to what, what's going to make an, have a great effect on something. And I think, I mean, all those platforms at the end of the day, they, they are the vehicle to deliver the message. Back then it was direct mail. I remember with, when I was working with Alan, we had the uh, like full page broadcast facts. <laughs> Bonnie, you remember those mm -hmm. broadcast facts, right? <laughs> The full page ad, like we did that, right? And then, yeah, then all these, like, of course, like with the Google and landing page and YouTube, all these things, but I did, they, it's, just a vehicle to deliver the message. I'm an experimenter. My first Google ad did a double digit click through rate. And that was after everybody had already inundated the market, you know, with, with things. The way that it was done was really simple. Yeah. I went through, I looked at the space that I had to write. Yeah. Okay. And again, this is Gary Halbert. This is the kind of thinking you do. This is the kind of thinking that, you know, 
that people who are in the know do. I was walking, I was going through it and I realized my URL had the, you know, the, the, the promise of what it is they were looking for at this, at this time it was, uh, it was some, it was free things to, to do. Mm. And I looked at what everybody else was looking in their ads. I was looking at what they were all doing and said to myself, which is the one, what would make me click on one versus the other. Mm. And I realized I was looking at these ads and I was going to dread the fact that each one's going to ask me to sign up. Right. Mm. So I just put in the line, no signups necessary. <laughs> and it boom it went right to the top and it was getting you know it, it, I mean it was it took off and I still offered value just like you know lead magnet Gary Halpert style yeah. offered value yeah. and then said you know here's extra value you get if you do sign up so the signups were coming in <laughs> but there was no point in you know but uh, and so I delivered value first before asking for a sign up and I delivered on that promise that you could get this stuff without having to sign up. Mm. You would get this great value. Mm. And it's the same thing that goes with Facebook where you turn around and you say, you know, here's a great checklist. Mm. Okay. In my, of, you know, that I'm offering to you for free and everything. Mm. And no, if you write in no signups necessary, you get people that will go, okay, wait a minute. This is different from the other ads. Let's see if he's really telling the truth. They mm. click on it. They see you really did deliver. And you say, by the way, I've got five other checklists you might be interested in here. You can sign up for them. Yes. You know, it all goes back to Gary Halbert thinking. And when you, you know, people like you study the original content, the original source, because so many people are just paraphrasing Gary Halbert or saying what he said in a different way. Mm. But when you really, really, really study all of that stuff and you get it and you study it often, and that's why I think it's better for uh, students of copy to read some core books multiple times than to read a hundred different books on a subject. And I noticed something interesting because um, Think about even with, with my brand, right? And then I, I want to ask your opinion on this because mm -hmm. people see what I do and they see me on social media and reaching so many people. And I get this quite a bit. Oh, you know, Dan Lok kind of came out of nowhere. I said, well, the reality is I've been online marketing since 2004, right? <laughs> yeah. It's because of, and then and study on the, like, you know, Gary's work, um, all, every, all the great, all the great marketers work, right? Even back to Claw Hopkins and David Ogilvy. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm thinking that one of the reasons why we're able to, to build our brand to this point, because I understand the fundamentals, right? The, the proven yeah. principles. I just executed better on social than most. That's really it. Right. So then they could see like it's it's kind of the let's say the the the, the old world and the new world that mm -hmm. I'm able to to bridge it. And I think that's really what 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 makes my brand work, because copywriting, even Alan back then, learning from Gary, taught me how to think. Not just the words, but how to think ideas and, and what works and now applying today. One thing that saddens me, I know if that's kind of bothers you as well, a lot of new marketers coming to you the new world, they have no clue. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I'm actually, I'm a little different than that. It doesn't sadden, it sadden me because it's what continues to make us special. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. You know, I, I, you know, this goes back to Gary Halbert thinking, I want my competition to suck. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Because they, they, like, you can see the, the, like the, the new guys, right? Yeah. What happens is they study stuff that's like very on a surface level, like this eras of stuff versus yeah. ignore Like I am shocked how many people I thought, oh, hey, do you know, do you know Joe Sugarman? Huh? <laughs> like what, what, what? Like Carl Hopkins, David, John Cable, huh? what? Who, who, what? Right? Yeah. They only well, know so-and-so, right? You know, it's like. <laughs> I actually, the way, you know, um, I like the fact that you know, here, here's, let me answer your question because it is, and it is not true for me about Saturn. What bothers me is, and I, and I get it. I'm really not holding it against them. It's just sad that it happens. Somebody will take my dad's lesson, like the starving crowd, and then they will, they'll plagiarize or paraphrase it, not plagiarize, they'll paraphrase it. Mm. And they'll start teaching their people. And at first they're like, you know, like I heard from Gary Halbert. And then eventually they stop saying Gary Halbert. And eventually they're just saying it. Now they're just getting quicker and to the point faster in their evolution, but pretty soon they stop crediting the source. Mm. 
Mm. Somebody has learned something and they will, they, you know, they've heard it four, through four or five different iterations or different people and then it gets watered down. It's no longer as good as the original mm. source. Yes. Now, for my father, if you read his version of A Starving Crowd, it's better than mine because he, he perfected it. Now, I'm watching my dad teach other people. And I'm going to the seminars. He actually one time said, you know, I'm going to the bathroom, go up on stage and give my A pal, B pal speech. <laughs> and I'm like, really? <laughs> and, but I saw him perfect the speech and make little changes over and over and over again mm -hmm. until he got it to exactly where he wanted it. Mm -hmm. And so when you paraphrase that, it loses a lot in the translation. And I would like to see other people, you know, go and get it from the source. I do believe that. But on top of that, here's the thing. The people who get it on a core level are the ones that are making a difference. And by that, I mean, there is, and this is going to be, it's going to sound self-aggrandizing, but it's really, I'm not trying to be self-aggrandizing this. There's a guy who's one of the best copywriters in the world I know of. And he turned and he said, you know, you're one of the best copywriting teachers I've ever seen. You know, I, I can do it. I know how to, I've got these record breakers, but the way that you teach and you show people, and it dawned on me that what was happening was I was learning the lessons and how to teach along the way that my dad was teaching all of these people who are, you know, mm -hmm. who are now, you know, actually now and were mentors to other copywriters, right? Yeah. So you're learning these lessons, but on top of that, you're actually, you're, you're taking it to a different level and you're going to be doing the same thing when you learn the core principles of stuff you can actually make the little changes that actually end up being revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a very small example. And again, this is not, you know, I know that, you know, you're like, your team asked me like, you know, where, what else do I do or and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You ever hear um, the masters like David Ogilvy once said that I'm not a great copywriter. What I am is a fantastic researcher and a terrific editor. Mm -hmm. You, do you, I mean, he's famous for making that saying. 100%. And you, hear, you hear the copywriter saying, you know, and the truth is this, the power is in the research. You know, the power that Domino's ad was just talking with customers and getting to know what they want. And that's what you do that's different, right? Yeah. When you get up and you do a YouTube channel, you say, what would make me do this? And, you know, uh, what would make me happy to see in this video that Dan is putting out? Yeah. Okay. And so you step into their shoes. Okay, you and the more you spend time with your customers, the more research, the more power what you're doing. And, has. and, and that's a great point because people notice like why my, my so YouTube blew up. It's, I said one of my secrets, it's not a secret. It's I look at and study the comments and I reply. So when people see my comment reply, they're like, is that really you? I said, it's me because I yeah. look at what it's, it's, I know it sounds so simple. Look at what people respond and react to. What, what do you want to know more of? And they would tell you, and then you take that. And you, but <laughs> here's the thing though, the power, that's the, the power is in that research where your yeah. talent comes from. Your talent comes from being able to identify this is where, this is the most important thing. So like your, you, your, your subscribers put out a hundred different things, questions or you know, comments and stuff. Yes. Your talent is being able to say, this is the one that's going to make everybody the happiest. So I'm going to deliver that first, yes, right? Yes. This is the second one. Yes. So the talent in marketing is actually, your, it's a gut instinct of saying, yes. what would I want if I was in that shoes? Now, yes. your professionalism, though, is all in the editing. The yes. difference between somebody who's driving down the street and has a great idea in their car, like, I got a headline, or they're in the shower. I got a headline. Yeah. Start writing. The difference between them and the people who put in the time and the effort to write record-bringing controls is they they did the first two part. They do more in the research than the other person does. Yes. They spend they don't spend as much time in that first draft. They no. spend more time in the editing. Yes. This is what dawned on me. Nobody wrote a book about editing. I was actually putting to get putting this together for something, and I was like, you know what? Nobody's ever written a book on editing sales copy before. So I rushed up to finish it. <laughs> and it's the, and this is all going back to your original point. Um, it's sad that people will take the, that people will take the original core principles, paraphrase it, water it down, make it a little weaker and not take it to the next level. Yeah. 
I prefer people who take that core principles, who study these things and say, you know what? Yes, everybody's talking about how to do, uh, about the research. Let's do something that shows them how to do the research. Hey, everybody's talking about, you know, that um, the, you know, doing editing, let's show them specific tips on editing, right? Mm -hmm. That allows them to go and make their copy better. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was frustrating to me was I would go and speak at events and, um, and it's because I'm an, uh, there, you don't have to be an empath an, uh, an empathetic person to be great at marketing. Yeah. But if you are empathetic, what happens is it, it kind of directs you a little bit. So one of the things that I, was driving me nuts was everybody's telling you what to do, but not telling you exactly how to do it. <laughs> yes. And I became one of these guys who was like, okay, this is how you do that. A, B, C, D, E, F. And, you know, and so as soon as I'm done speaking, they can turn around and actually do it. Mm. And the reason for that was because my, this goes back to your original question. My dad taught me, give the good stuff. You know, he taught me to, you know, show people how to do things and, you know, don't, don't worry about whether or not you get a payoff immediately. The payoff is in your brand, is in your record, you know, and people recognize. You're building, like now, in now today's term, you're building brand equity, right? That's what, that's that, what, yeah, it's a smart thing to do. It's the and, right thing to do and it's a smart thing to do. So in your videos, you know, imagine where you would be if in your videos they all said you need to do this and if you want to learn how to do this, you have to buy X, mm. right? And they had no value whatsoever, mm. right? That you're not going to get people who are, you know, rabid fans that are, you know, because there's so many people who are doing that. I'm putting you in my spam box example that we were just yeah. talking about. Yes, yes. There's and and even though you delivered value, because remember in that in that example I gave you, even if the person delivered value, it's mm -hmm. not like you went back and signed up and changed your email address. He still he or she's message is still going off into the ethos. <laughs> And no, and nobody's getting nobody's getting anything through. So I think I'm glad that um, people understand who understand the principles that understand to give some really good uh, quality stuff out and to teach people and have a genuine interest in helping people along. And that's another thing that I will say that is really really important for copywriters that a lot of people forget about. You have to learn how to teach as a copywriter mm. because. Guess who you are going to be spending the most time teaching? Your clients. Mm. You have to explain to them. So many, mm -hmm. so many good copywriting deals are ruined because the client themselves are targeting the wrong market or they're not making the offer that they should be making. Mm. So here's one of the things that's the difference between an average copywriter and a legendary copywriter and how come it's so much easier for them. Somebody without a name goes up and says, you know, they're hired, and we were talking about this earlier, they're hired as a commodity. Mm. So that commodity copywriter comes in and says, you know, this one is good. You should actually give this away for free because it's got such a high reorder rate. Or you should do a double your money back guarantee. Or you should offer this first and this. Nobody's listening to that. You're just a hired gun. Shut up and do your job. Yeah. Gary Halbert says, Hey, wait a minute. I've got an idea. Okay, what's that idea? Here's my check. They say, <laughs> Gary, <laughs> Halbert, yes. Gary Halbert says, what you need to do is try this and this and that. And they, they listen, they try, and they do things. But the difference that you can make is because when I, I remember testing this, I went to a meetup one time. This is long out, about a year after my father had passed away. Mm. And I had spent like every day of my adult life talking with my father and often about marketing. A lot of people don't know it. I was working with them. I was, uh, we were partners on the, his biggest promotion. The what actually not his biggest promotion, the promotion that brought him in more money than the other promotions mm. did because there's more money in owning your promotion than in Doing writing. Your other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so he could, you know, as, as what I did was I was a little kind of um, uh, like wanted to talk shop. So I went to a meetup, but I went to the meetup and I didn't tell anybody who I was. Mm. And they're doing name tags. So I just wrote Bond, but I avoided the word Halbert. Halbert yeah. Right. And I was talking with this lady and she I said, what do you do? She says, I'm a product photographer. 
And I said, oh, that's great. Now, how do you get business? And she says, well, I send out, I create a great photograph in a, in a postcard. I send it to business. Mm. And then I have this lady who I hire who does follow-up calls. Mm. And I'm just amazed that she's taking action. Because as you know, finding people who study is easy. Finding people who take action, yeah. much more difficult, right? <laughs> so... I said, that's great. You know what you ought to do is just use one of the classic lines, like seven things you need to know before hiring your next product photographer and talk about how a, the a product photographer is different from a regular photographer. They, yes, they have to know about aperture and lighting and how to stage things, but a good product photographer knows how to capture the emotion that sells your product. Mm. She turns away from them. Right. And I'm like, okay, I've lost her, but she's actually digging for a pen out of her purse. And she comes back, she's like, you know, you're really good at this, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're pretty good at this. Oh my <laughs> No clue. Uh, and here's the point of it. The point of it is without telling her who I was, yes. and pretty soon there's a group of people who are listening to what I'm saying. Yes. Because I'm teaching them, yes. okay? And the ability to teach people things is something that you're gonna need as a copywriter to make those deals better, to make your copy go well. My dad, because, you know, again, I worked with him, so I'm constantly with him and the clients and everything like that. He spent a great deal of his time teaching his clients why they should do what they should be doing. Right. And with that, if you have that ability, your chances of you writing blockbuster promotion goes up dramatically because right. they, because you get to make the changes. No, what do you mean you're going to add a dollar to every one of my pieces of mail? Are you crazy? That'll send my costs through the roof. Mm. Yes, but this is why it works to send a dollar bill mailing. He had to teach people that. They didn't just say, you know, oh, yeah. Um, and so you, if you can teach it, it doesn't make a difference if your last name is Halbert or not. Okay? Mm. I proved that. So one thing copywriters, even if you don't plan on teaching people copywriting, Teaching people does a couple things. One, it makes you better at what you do. Mm. You know, you can't say that. I, I wouldn't look at you and say that you don't know. You can't say that you don't know your business marketing, promotion, self brand better than if you didn't teach it. By teaching it, it, it does make you better at stuff. Yeah. But more importantly, when you go deal with clients as a copywriter, your ability to convince and persuade them to do the right promotion makes a huge difference between whether you're not you get treated like a commodity yeah. or you get treated more like a legend yeah. and that's and that's a big distinction and it makes your life a lot easier <laughs> and sometimes to solve the problems it maybe is not the copy not the words maybe it's the offer maybe it's the pricing maybe it's your different follow-up it's sometimes like it's like hey this is what we've been doing it doesn't work just hire a copywriter like sometimes they treat copywriters as the miracle workers right everything would be would be solved and someone with understand strategy, they look at this, why are you even doing this at all, right? Why don't you go back and sell more to your existing customers? Like, duh, right? Like, well, it's was, those type of things, right? There was a great example that Clayton made these. I was talking with him one time and he, he was going to this company and he called them up and he says, hey, listen, you know, and they were making money on the front end, which back in the day was a rare thing. What mm. you did was you spent... You know, after delivering the product that you sold in an ad and all of this other stuff, Talk you even or you lost money and then you made money on the back end. Mm. So what he did was he was calling this company who was running these ads and he said, hey, listen, I want to know, can I rent your list? He's, they're like, why? He goes, what are you selling to your list afterwards? And I go, what do you mean selling to our list? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, okay. I need a meeting with you. I'm going to hop on a plane and we're going to have a discussion. Right? Yeah, we, need a, we need a talk. <laughs> and so it was my, and, and this is one of the things that was kind of weird about my dad, but I understand it now. And the reason I understand it is because he liked to solve problems. I like to solve problems. And then you just like, you do it. And then you walk away from it because you want to go solve another problem instead of yes. building business around. Yes. Well, my dad had these blockbuster winners that made money on the front end, which were just for everybody's, you know, it's very uh, rare, just so it's very it's, rare, very it's extremely rare. And it just means that you put in an ad and you make money just running that ad that you're not just you're building getting your customers at a profit. Like, yeah, you're, you're at a profit from the very first transaction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Extremely rare, but he had all these ads that were break even or lost just a little bit. 
Yeah. And he knew it because he would tell me, go, Bond, you know, you put a hands, you put a promotion like that in the hands of like Eric and they're going to make millions on it. Yeah. But I'm only, I'm only swinging for these fences and I want home runs. Mm. And he let, he walked away from a lot of ads that were break even. And if he was just, you know, set up affiliate deals or sold them something after he had spent that money acquiring the contact information, mm. he would have, you know, they would have been, they could have built big companies off of it. Mm. And the only reason I got it now is because I would do something and it was like, okay, that really worked. That's great. Try it again, or maybe even three times at the most, because the way I say it is, you know, you're always experimenting. Here's something that's fun. The biggest winners, and tell me if this is true in your business as well. Your most, the, the largest, the, the best video, the most well-liked video, the, the most successful ad campaign mm. is almost always a shock to the person who created it. Yes. They're like, wow, I didn't expect that to go that well, right? And they start to learn to just experiment. Try this, try that, do this. And because they're trying something radically new, it has the one thing, and I asked this in a copy club not long ago, I said, what's the one thing that great blockbusters really have in common? And there's certain things all ads that have in common, attention, interest, desire, action, things like that. Yeah. I said, the one thing that they really have in common that a lot of people have a hard time replicating is they don't sound like anything that you've read or heard before. Yes, yes. And because somebody experimented, they threw something at the wall to see if it would stick, yeah. you know? And so if you, you know, when you do those experiments, you do it once and then you try and if it, it could be just a fluke, but if you try it a second time mm. and you reverse engineer why the first two works and you can get it done a third time, you can build a business out of it. Mm. So when my dad did the dollar bill mailing the first time, it was like, wow, that worked. I wonder if it would work again. Yes. It did. He wondered if he'd work again. Now, I think his opening for the dollar bill letter is probably the most replicated piece of copy in history. You know, you know, hey, Dan, you know, I've, as you can see, I've attached a dollar bill to the top of this letter. and yes. I've done so for two reasons, you know. Yes. Yes. Anyway, when the, the third one happened, now all of a sudden, my dad, whenever a client came in, and they had a relatively decent working control, but there was enough profit per unit of sale to cover sending that extra dollar. Yeah. He could just, he could take their existing control, not change anything other than the opening and add a dollar bill to it and yeah. send it in an A pile letter and an A pile mailing and break their, beat their control, just break their records. Right. You know, because if he, so the point that I'm making is you, you do it once, You've, you might have been a fluke. If you can do, replicate it and do it three times, you can build an entire business out of it. And, you know, and you can, you can cash in on it for a very, very long time. Mm. And so, you know, but tell me if I'm not wrong. I mean, the, when, you, when you have, sometimes you do a video and you're like, wow, that was, you know, I didn't expect that to be yeah. as big as it turned out to be. Hey, you know that little experiment you got, you know, that, you know, that email that you guys wrote that we decided to try, <laughs> you know, it's doing better than the other ones. <laughs> yes. And, and that's why when I was in college and everybody's like, well, we got this prospectus and it says that, you know, the, the market's got $4 billion and we're hoping to get 4% of it. It's like, you're just pulling numbers out of thin air, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's very, very true. But, but they didn't know I already had a lot of experience that, you know, they're, you know, when I was in the class, you know, <laughs> And in Bond, for someone, let's say for, a, for my listener, for my audience, if they want to learn more about copywriting, like what's, what's the best way if they want to, they can go to GaryHarbertLetter.com, of course, they can get access to that. Um, are there resources you would recommend or like you've, you've put together, you've helped maybe take some Gary's uh, materials? And, we have, and I'm glad you asked that. Um, okay, so I'm going to give you um, um, a, a guiding point. Yes. And I'm going to tell you another source. Um, one is go to halbertizing.com. Okay. One of the things my brother and I wanted to do was kind of preserve what my dad had going for himself. So we didn't want to like, you know, have anybody feel like we're taking his name for a ride um, or anything like that. So if we do something that is extremely Gary Halbert specific, like the Gary Halbert Memorial mm -hmm. Seminar we did, we can put that on the Gary Halbert level. But if it's something I do, 
Mm. That's in conjunction with the family name and the family history and the family legacy. We usually will put them up offers on halbertizing.com. Awesome. We have it with an S and a Z. Awesome. But, but the number one place I would go is if you, if you are on Facebook, you know, if you don't mind me mentioning it, I think no, that no, I'll, put it, I'll put it in a show note. Absolutely. Please, please mention it. Go to the Gary Halbert copy club. Because I'm about to put in my own opinion of what's the exact resources in order to, that's a fast track to learning copy. Mm. And because I, you know, when I was growing up, somebody said, what's the best books to read on copy? There was like five or six. You might as well read them all. <laughs> yes. you know, now you want to read a few books on copy, but you also want to read more on what we were talking about earlier, critical thinking mm. and marketing you know, branding, um, you know, the, and, you know, and again, specific, this is one of the reasons I don't think there'll ever be another Gary Halbert is, um, is because now if you want to go up, if you want to break a record in all these niches and just one niche, you got to go up against somebody who's been breaking records for 10, 20 years in that yeah. one niche. Yeah. But now there's somebody who's breaking those records in email and yeah. there's somebody who's breaking those records on social. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's, so, so it's, it's almost like it's within the vertical. There are many, many like subcategories and it takes a long time just to master that one. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I myself, you know, I mean, I, if, if I wanted to do Instagram marketing, I've got to go and talk to somebody who knows a lot more about Instagram and what's the format they like, mm. you know, how many, how many pixels and words am I allowed to use and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Now I'd still rather have my skill of messaging, right? And then go get the tech from someone else. Yeah. But the point is, I think now um, when you want to fast track it, if you, if you started, the biggest thing that I will say is this, and I, and I really believe this, practice is more important than studying. Okay? I love it. Yes. And, and I think uh, Gary has a quote, um, motion beats meditation, right? Yes. It, you know what? Bravo. Because you know what? When we talk about people watering down this stuff, I hear so many people watering down that phrase and it's it is it is definitely motion over meditation and yep. you know and what he and it's true because what you want to do is as soon as you get into a couple of books as soon as you take a course these are all there's there's resources there's great stuff to learn and i'd be glad to help point people in that direction hmm. but as soon as you possibly can get some experience actually writing and working with a mentor or and doing that kind of stuff, the better off you're going to be, and the it faster. It's the self confidence, right? Now you know, hey, you know, it's a thought is not as hard as I thought it would be. Can yeah, there's your self esteem and confidence, and you're you're more motivated to do more, right? Yeah, and I think you know, with your projects you've got planned, are going to help people go along the way in doing that. And so, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's why, like, I'm teaching them, like, with my program, cooperating. I'm not teaching them long form yet. I'm teaching them, let, let's do the email. Let's do the short ads, like short form copy so they can get feedback, get data from the, from the, from the marketplace. And it just builds the confidence, right? Versus now, hey, here's a 20 page, you know, letter that you're gonna write. It's, it's too daunting for most. Like, yeah. Short, like, let, let's learn how to do that Instagram post. How to do that short email, right? How to do that uh, a chat bot. How to do the email. Like those things, it builds their confidence that they can do it quick, right? I think that I think what you're on exactly the right track and what should be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, you need to learn one trick for headline writing. Okay. Yes. So that's your attention. You learn um, interest is, you know, this is a quick one. Ada, uh, you know, you know, the formula, right? And it's mm -hmm. not really, this isn't the same thing as a template. So don't, I don't want people, to, I'm not a big fan of templates myself. Mm -hmm. Um, they do work versus having nothing, right? <laughs> for beginners, for beginners. Absolutely. And I'm, and I'm not against them, but all, all of it really is ADA, attention, interest, desire, and action. And that Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross movie got it wrong. It's not decision. It's, it's, <laughs> it's desire. <laughs> desire, yes. Well, because I was watching the movie and, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, that he's got that wrong. <laughs> And I was questioning myself. I went back and I'm like, no, no, really, dad. You know, I'm like, yeah, no, he's like, no, it's always been higher. But the attention part is headline, right? Interest is something salacious. It's, it's a story. It's, you know, stuff like that. You learn how to get, keep interest one way. Um, you learn how to uh, learn one or two tricks for desire. You learn one or two tricks for action. And even if you learn just one for each of these four phases, you have the core fundamentals to start practicing then add to your arsenal later. You can add 
and learn the, the three or four different ways of writing a killer headline. You can learn the four or five different ways of grabbing somebody's interest and keeping it and, you know, setting anchors, all of the other stuff that, you know, you teach. Um, and then desire and closing actions. There's lots of different ways to do each of these. Mm. But the best tactic is not to learn all 50 different ways of doing any one thing. The best thing to do is start practicing as soon as you learn one. So the best advice that I can ever give anybody is if you ever have access to somebody's list and they're willing to let you write even for free to get real world experience, mm. um, the, it, you want to test everything you learn because so many times going through these processes where I see somebody teaches somebody something and it gets, it goes out of their head really quickly mm. because they don't put it into action and, or worse, they actually say, this is what I'm going to do. I need to be here. And I've taken this course on Facebook marketing and now I'm, you know, and I've studied and I'm going to launch this and they put a gear into it. And they're going to launch this thing that goes to teenage girls on Facebook. And they get to a guy like me who goes, what are you talking about? There's no teenage girls on Facebook. They're all over on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. You know, so the best thing you can do is when somebody teaches you something, go test it. And if it works, it'll, that, that lesson will be burned into your brain. And if it doesn't work, then what's going to happen is you're not going to waste a lot of time and you're going to move on to the thing that might, to finding what actually will work. But motion over meditation, 100%. And just remember one thing. As a copywriter, everybody stinks in the beginning. Everybody does. It's better to get over stinking now than to wait a year or 10 years to get over it then. Yes, so, yes. Very, yeah. very true. Uh, thank you so much, Bon. I mean, I, I could, we could talk all day. I would, I have, yeah. like, I'm so glad we, we connect because um, this is definitely... The, the highlight and I hope this is the, this is the beginning of, of a long-term friendship I'm so glad that, that we connected and thank you for being here like this, this I, is awesome and it brought back a lot of memories because it's, it's very personal for me right? I truly enjoyed it and I love talking about my father and <laughs> <laughs> and I like I like the uh, projects that you've outlined that you got going I think I think it, it can be a great thing thank you thank you Bon appreciate it thank you